everybody this is Chuck King from Ford City on April 1st I wish it were uh, fooling around with what we're going through but it's not it's not a joke it's real we've had in one day nearly another thousand people pass away in the US from the virus it seems to be uh, continually taking people down here and around the world we should not be filled with fear but we should be praying I was thinking today that there are many many people still working they're out there on the front lines even if they're working at their normal job at, at Walmart or a grocery store they're exposing themselves to the people who have to come in and buy groceries and it's a difficult time for them as well as for the frontline people in the the medical field and, and our police and our met our army and uh, military people that are helping out and, and all the uh, pressure that's on every government official whether it's federal state or, or local so we need to take this really seriously they don't even understand the virus and what it can do but we see it's killing people and uh, if it if it becomes the the plague that they the president talked about yesterday you know 200,000 or more people uh, passing away uh, from from the virus if we don't contain it and so you think about that there's been about 4,000 die so to get up to 200,000 would be a huge problem for our nation so let's pray those of us who are doing our part by staying home most of the time we should be praying for all the other people we should be lifting them up interceding for them because it's a perilous time none of us have ever faced it our nation has never faced a time like this before with the the economy being so broken it's almost as bad as during the Great Depression with the unemployment and those all sound like negative things, and they are. Yet our hope is still in the Lord. We're trusting Him. Uh, the other nations are suffering even more than we are because their economy w was not good to begin with. Their medical facilities not good to begin with. Uh, their resources are not available. So remember, this is an international problem that billions of people are facing, and that 350 million people in the United States are facing so as we go to prayer let's remember all these things and trust the Lord because this, this is too great for any one of us we have to trust in him let's pray father today another day of anxiety is upon us because of this virus that's going uh, doing its damage among so many people and we pray now in Jesus' name for the sick, for, for the families of those who have passed on, and for all those who are serving them, trying to keep them alive, risking their own lives to help other people. Father, put your protection around them, your hedge of glory, and save these people. We don't know how to pray except to cry out for mercy. This nation deserves judgment because of its sins, the nations of the world deserve your judgment and we know that your judgment will come to pass it seems like we're we've entered the last days and we see these kinds of things coming like birth pains upon the earth and upon the nations one after the other but we're asking lord for your wisdom and direction as we as we uh, go through these uncharted waters and as believers we keep our faith in you that your word will come to pass, your prophecies will be fulfilled, that every plan that you have uh, will, will uh, come to pass, your word will never fail, and that we have to trust you, Lord, because you are in control, and you allow these things to happen for your purpose, even where we don't understand. We pray for more grace, though, more strength in the midst of the storm that you would keep us, keep us focused on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to understand your word so that your word would wash us and encourage us and correct us 
So, Lord, we, we just lift up uh, the great needs of the people to you and trust you, Lord, to do a mighty work, miraculous work by your spirit to draw hearts of men, women, and children to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, our only hope of eternal life. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're turning to Ephesians chapter 2 today, beginning in verse 1. We're going to study the first 10 verses. And uh, if you would, please hit the share button when you see the video uh, pop up with the share button after we're finished, because we're trying to reach as many people as we can with the, the hope and the revelation that comes from the Word of God. These are times when people need they need the foundation built in their lives. So many have neglected the Word of God. They've neglected seeking after the Lord. And now their eyes are being opened due to this crisis, and they're beginning to examine themselves, and they should. Because, uh, you know, death is the final enemy, according to Scripture. After, after death, there's no, there's no more enemies left. Because uh, Jesus said, don't fear him who can kill your body, but fear him who can put your soul in eternal hell. And this is what the reality of every human being facing uh, the ultimate judgment before our creator. We don't, we won't be judged based on our own opinions or the opinions of others, but rather, what does God think about my life? How did my life shape up in his eyes? Was I a person of faith who believed his word when I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, when I heard about the great love of our Father God, the creator of heaven and earth for the whole world, that in its fallen state, he sent his only son to become the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. But we know that's not automatic because people have to, they have to volunteer to humble themselves, repent and believe the gospel. That's what we're going to talk about here today from Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's what uh, Paul begins with. He, he talks to the church. These are, again, they're Pentecostal believers now in the city and the environs of uh, Ephesus. And he's telling them as Christians, as disciples, that, in the past, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. My friends, this is the reality of every human being. Since the Garden of Eden, when the first two human beings yielded to deception of the fallen angel Lucifer, now we call him Satan, fell to his deception to, to rebel against God and his only commandment, not don't eat from that tree, and yet they yielded to satanic deception and ate anyway. And, and once they ate, there was spiritual death and eventually physical death come upon them. We were dead, all of us, in our sins and trespasses. Verse 2, in which, we, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. This lays the responsibility for the, the, the failure of the human race squarely upon satanic power. We were deceived as a race, as a human race, by the, the devil, the prince of the air, the spirit working among the unbelievers all over the world throughout history. We all formerly now, I want to say we were dead and we formerly walked like the world. We walked according to the course or the wisdom or the pattern of the world. And who was motivating that? Who is motivating that? But the devil himself and his legions of fallen angels. They are working even today. Uh, uh, all over the earth, and I, I see this virus as an example of that. God has allowed this evil to come upon the world for judgment and to wake up the nations. 
verse 3. Among them, two, all formerly lived, we all too for, formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were na by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So all of us who are believers today, we have to humbly admit that we were all living like that. How are we living? In the lusts of the flesh, in the desires of our flesh and mind. We were indulging in those desires. The human being is capable of horrible evil. All you have to do is read the Bible and see that played out throughout human history. All you have to do is look at the news today. People are evil in their, na in their natural selves, capable of inventing things to do against God's word that have never been done before. We see it happening in our own culture. And we were children of wrath. Because when you live like that, you are under the wrath of God. The wages of sin is death. God will judge sin. He has to judge sin. He cannot just let it go. The judgment came immediately. The, the, the judgment was spoken over Adam and Eve and, and, uh, and over Eve, the devil uh, of what would come. This, uh, the, this great death upon the human race. The judgment eventually upon uh, Satan where Jesus would crush his head. From Genesis chapter 3, three we have that first prophetic word about the seed of of the man, or the seed of the woman, would crush the head of Satan. And we've seen that played out throughout history, where Jesus has come at just the right time, at the Father's bidding, to come and live and die and rise from the dead and ascend to the Father for the glory of God, to fulfill the prophetic word and the plan and the will of God that was decided in all eternity past, before the earth was ever made by him. So Paul's he's talking to the Christians, reminding them they've come out of the same darkness as everyone else that's still living in darkness. Verse number four. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, never forget, that mercy triumphs over judgment. God is just, but he's also merciful. He is a jealous God, but he is the loving God. We can't comprehend all of that with our minds because of our, uh, our finite ability, but his infinite power and glory make him that holy, righteous God and that loving and merciful God all at the same time. The mercy of God triumphed over his right to judge us, to destroy us. His great love, his great love has made the difference. Verse 5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So even though he, he should have destroyed us all because of our sin as a human race and as individuals. He does bring judgment and he will bring judgment, but he hasn't destroyed us. He's given us a, a, a way out through Jesus Christ, a salvation through the Lord Jesus. This great love and mercy has been demonstrated. In John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish will not perish, but will have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. This is the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though we all lived those, those judge, judgeable lifestyles, we deserve judgment because of our sin. No one is clean. If you try to say you have no sin, you're a liar. 
and you also call God a liar by saying that you don't have sin. When we humble ourselves and admit who we are, we realize all of us have come from the same fallen race of human beings. But because of the mercy and the love of God, he has extended salvation to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Even, verse 5, even when we were lost, when we were dead in our sins, that's when he saved us. He didn't save us when we were all living a righteous life, doing our best, pleasing him, he saved us at our lowest point of disobedience and rebellion. That's when Jesus died. That's when he reached out to each one of us. In fact, it was at the point of your life, if you're a Christian today, truly born again, spirit-filled, it was at a point of your life when you were low down, you were you were really in bad shape spiritually. And he extended his mercy to you through the revelation of his loving conviction and the revelation of the truth of the gospel so that he opened your spiritual eyes and ears to, for the first time, understand who Jesus is, what he did for you, and what he will do for you if you would believe. And that's how we got saved. At the lowest point of our failures, he reached out his hand of mercy to us. May his name be glorified. Verse number six. And he raised us up with him, with Jesus, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He raised us up. We were dead in our sin. And his great love and mercy extended to each one who believes transforms our lives from being dead in sin and on our way to hell. He raised us up by his wonderful mercy and grace to become the children of God. That's what the gospel tells us. Verse 7, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I, I want you to remember that always the goal of our faith and our life serving the Lord, always looking forward to eternity. Eternity is the real life. Second Corinthians 5 says that God has made us for eternity. Yes, well, there'll be death here, the final enemy, physical death. But eternal life in Christ lasts forever and ever. And this scripture reminds us again that it's the coming ages, the, the eternal ages ahead, where he will show to us the riches of his grace and his kindness in Jesus Christ. It's not just this life, this life as we studied before is just a down payment, the grace of God that we walk in, in our life on earth is just a down payment of what's to come. Eye has not seen nor ear heard what God has in store for those who love him, the scripture says. It's beyond our comprehension and our knowledge to know what's coming in the eternal ages before us. That'll excite you. And motivate you to keep your eyes on Jesus. Because he's talking about the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness that will be demonstrated to us for all eternity. Praise the Lord. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You see, it's grace Again, God's provision of power, his provision of strength, supernatural that we don't have naturally. We don't have the human uh, uh, ability to do the things that need to be done to please him. So he imparts to us the Holy Spirit, the grace of God, the power from on high, the undeserved ability that comes through what? Through faith. You see, faith 
that he, he actually gives us that as part of the gift. Faith and grace are the gift of God. He has to give you the faith. He has given us faith. Those of us believe he has given us a measure of faith. It comes from him because naturally we're doubters and unbelievers and rebels, but God gives us the ability to believe him. We're dependent on him for that. It's part of this process, the faith. And then what comes because of faith? The grace of God. When we believe him, then he begins to pour out the supernatural power in our lives. He begins to work in us. It's not of ourselves. Do you see that? The grace and the faith are not natural. It's not from ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of God. That means it's freely given by him, not based upon our ability. This is what grace really means. It doesn't mean that no matter what I do, no matter what sin I commit, it's okay because the grace of God has taken care of that. No, that's not biblical. The grace of God is the power that comes from God to enable us to live a life that pleases him, to motivate us to say no to our carnal nature and to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. The grace of God is powerful strength that comes into the life of a human being that has been brought out of darkness, out of the lie of Satan, and been transferred into a new kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, by faith and grace. These are, these are the gifts of God that are so necessary. They're required for our salvation, and it cannot depend on us or we would fail. It comes only from God. Believe the word of God today. The gift of God is available to everyone who believes. Verse number nine, not as a result of works, human effort, trying to keep a law, trying to keep rules. Your salvation doesn't come by the result of your works. Because if it did, then we would boast. We would say, look how good I've been. I'm a good person. God owes me a trip to heaven, eternal life, because I've been so good. Well, that's not true. We're all failures. We can't be saved by our own works, or we would boast about it. Now, the only one we can boast in is the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us should look in a mirror and say, without the grace of God, without the gift of faith and grace, I would be lost on my way to hell. Look at verse 10, the final verse today in this short study. For we are his workmanship. Did you know you are his workmanship? What does that mean? For you, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, remember we studied that before the earth was ever formed, the foundations were ever laid, the will of God was that he would send Jesus to redeem us and to transform us. Never forget what the scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are representing him alone. We're not representing ourselves. We're not representing our culture. We're not representing our nation or the laws of our country. We are representing him as ambassadors. And ambassadors only do what the king sends them to do. Our Lord Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. And our ministry and our message must be the message and the ministry of reconciliation. It means, it means that we must go to a, a fallen world, lost, caught in the chains of satanic bondage, and preach a simple gospel that we have described here. The love of God, the mercy of God, that in the midst of our failures has extended his love 
in such a way that his, his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, was sacrificed for the sins of the world and his blood shed to purchase our salvation. And he rose again from the dead, defying death. And he sits now after ascending to the Father's right hand. He sits at the Father's right hand of power, awaiting his second coming to redeem his church from the grave, to transform any living believers into their resurrected bodies, and to defeat the satanic armies once and for all and bring judgment, final judgment to the world. This is the God we serve. Our Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon. He promised these kinds of events leading up to his return. And we know that while we're here, we must continue preaching and living the gospel. When you read the Olivet Discourses, of, whether it's Matthew 24, Mark 13, or Luke 21, you read about what's coming during the tribulation days and the coming of Jesus. And you will see that in the midst of that difficult time, the scripture says this gospel shall be preached in all the world, to all the nations, and then the end will come. We need to be about the Father's business. We are his workmanship. That means he's working in us. How? By mercy and grace. He's given us faith. He's given us grace. And he expects us to embrace that cross daily and follow him. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, not to be constant failures that use an excuse that grace is going to cover my sins. No, we are people empowered by the, the King of glory, by the power of the Holy Spirit, able by his strength to do the things that are pleasing to him. And he, he had that planned before the foundations of the world were ever laid. That's what we're talking about in these first 10 verses. Never forget where we came from. Never forget the power and the glory that has been revealed to everyone who is born again and spirit-filled. At the same time, we must remember how lost the world is. The majority of the human race does not know Jesus Christ. And we need to be his workmanship empowered by faith and grace to go forth to the nations to preach this glorious gospel, and then the end will come. My friends, let's apply this. Let's ask ourselves some questions. Are we living as the workmanship of Christ, or are we trying to continue to boast in our own works? Galatians confirms this teaching, and now we're in Ephesians, and we're seeing the same message. It's the power of God that we need. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 that you've reminded us of your love and your mercy extended through Jesus Christ to save us for all eternity. Not only now, but for all eternity you've called us to be your servants. We ask now, Lord, that everyone hearing this message would humble themselves and if they're not right with you, Lord, they would cry out for mercy. They would seek your face. Your word says if we seek you, we will find you if we search for you with all of our heart. And we know that if we draw near to you, then you will draw near to us. But we need to humble ourselves and cry out to you, forgiving, uh, confessing our sins that you might forgive us and cleanse us and restore us through repentance. May everyone experience this glorious fellowship, this koinonia relationship with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in these last days of turmoil, give us your marching orders. Show us what you want us to do. And enable us by your Spirit to continue serving others, preaching the gospel, obeying your word, that we might be the lights in a dark place. May your will be done. May your name be glorified. And we cry out to you, even so, come Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please hit the share button so we can get this word out, this simple teaching 
of, of the uh, Ephesians chapter 1. God bless you all. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow at noon. Stay safe. Keep your eyes on Jesus.